I'd uh, like to welcome everybody to the Cybersecurity and in Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CISIAC, webinar titled, An Architecture-Centric Virtual Integration Strategy to Safety-Critical System Verification. Uh, my name is Tom McGibbon from the CISIAC. Um, our pre presenter today is Dr. Peter Feiler, who I will introduce in a few minutes. Uh, before we begin, uh, a few ad admin comments. Um, all the phones have been muted except for the presenters today. Um, questions, however, can be asked at any time uh, during the presentation by entering them through the Q&A or the chat pane in your WebEx control panel. Uh, I will be monitoring the questions and we will hopefully have some time at the end to answer those questions. Um, Copies of the slides will be available afterwards. Um, if you would like to receive a copy of the slides, please send me a request. You can see my email address at the bottom of the slide uh, here. Also, uh, we could receive a lot of questions. We are recording this, um, this event, uh, and it, the recording, the video and audio recording will be posted, and once it has been posted, we will distribute a link. Now, today, to begin today's presentation, let me give a brief overview about the CISIAC. First of all, again, please note my email address for any follow-up questions you might have. But the CISIAC is operated by Quantarian Solutions Incorporated. That's who I work for. And, but we are funded through the Department of Defense, uh, their Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC. So funding for today's free webinar is provided in part by DTIC. Uh, the CISIAC is a specialized technical focal point and information clearinghouse for information assurance, cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management. Uh, please check out our website and join our community of practice at www.thecisiac.com. Um, also, we have a couple of discussion groups on LinkedIn. One is called CISIAC Software Intensive Systems, and the other one is called CISIAC Information Assurance. So, uh, feel free to check those out and uh, join in the conversation. Um, so now I'll, uh, I'll like to introduce our presenter. Uh, Dr. Peter Feiler is a 28-year veteran and is currently a senior member of the Architecture Practice Initiative of the Software Engineering Institute. His current research interest is in improving the quality of safety-critical software-intensive systems, also known as cyber-physical systems, through architecture-centric virtual integration and analysis to reduce rework and qualification costs. Uh, Peter has been the technical lead and main author of the SAE Architecture Analysis and Design Language Standard. He has a PhD in computer science from Carnegie Mellon. So now I'll turn this presentation over to Peter. Welcome, Peter. Hey, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Um, the topic of um, the presentation today is Architecture-Centric Virtual Integration Strategy to Safety uh, Critical System Verification. Uh, the way I'm going to approach it is lay out the problem space first and then talk about a <coughs> strategy that comes uh, is centered around uh, this SAE AADL standard that was just mentioned and then address different aspects of um, software intensive system development that need to be in place in order to improve where we are today. <clears throat> when you have safety critical systems, they are, need to be certified before they can be used, and certification means uh, we are assuring the quality of a delivered system by bringing sufficient evidence that the implementation meets system requirements. And in that context, both the quality of the requirements and the quality of the evidence determine what the quality of the system is. When we look at today's uh, practice, and you'll see more detail in the next slide, we are spending uh, almost 50% of the total system cost on rework that is due to the fact that we are trying to make it through the certification process. If you have a system that needs to be recertified, then, the co uh, then it's even more challenging because we are going through a very <coughs> a complete recertification process that is identical to the original certification. So the cost for recertification is currently not proportional to the kind of changes that you want to introduce into the system. When looking at uh, current development practice, a uh, number of studies have been done in that context by NIST and by others, trying to understand what is it that causes uh, this 
cost explosion in software uh, intensive system development. And what was found is that 70% of errors are introduced during requirements and architectural design, and only 3% of those errors are caught in phase. And it is not until post unit testing that 80% of um, errors are caused. When you look at the chart, the first number indicates the percentage of errors introduced in a particular development phase, the second percentage number errors caught, <laughs> and then the third figure indicates the uh, multiplication factor for a rework if the um, rework is done not in phase but later on. And what you see is that the uh, rework cost on the system that has been deployed uh, is 300 to 1,000 times the original cost of fixing it in phase or when you're doing uh, acceptance testing at that point it's 80 to 100 times the cost. Uh, one of the things that you run into then is uh, because of the higher certification cost is that um, a lot of system software fixes are in place but cannot be installed because of the high recertification, which then leads to system operators spending a large percentage of their time doing uh, workarounds to software fixes that exist but cannot be installed because of uh, high recertification cost. And in one case for a <coughs> ground station system for satellite type of uh, uh, applications, <coughs> operators are spending as much as 75% um, of their time doing workarounds as compared to actual uh, operational uh, activities. So there's a clear need to uh, addressing that problem. One of the things that you also have is there's the high cost at the back end of your development process and any kind of investment you can make early in the process catching discovering errors in phase uh, would uh, lead to great cost savings. To better understand what those problems are, we can now look at some of the technical issues underneath. This is now from an article about uh, an event that occurred with uh, an aircraft uh, flying um, from Australia to the US. And in the report, you find statements like, this appears to be a unique event. Um, when the problem occurred, the one subsystem was shut off, but uh, that data will continue to be propagated throughout the system. Uh, it basically indicates that uh, some of the problems that are occurring um, are not well understood and they can be traced to um, interactions between system components and particular system components with functionalities nowadays implemented in software. And it's the interaction between these things that uh, has assumptions made and those mismatched assumptions lead to those problems. To illustrate that, uh, what you have is in a traditional process, you do system engineering, you have the system under control and your control system. And uh, these systems together are um, evolving, requirements are developed by system engineers. We look at the interaction between the system and its environment, the hazards uh, that impact, uh, that are the result of uh, system failures, um, interactions between the operator and the system, um, and also assumptions made uh, when a control system is developed about the physical system, uh, properties like the lag and the proximity of parts and so on. As we add an implementation of the system through software, um, a number of additional dimensions are added in where there's a potential for mismatched assumptions. Individual functionality of your uh, software units gets translated into software. In that case, you then use software representation for the application. You may have a mismatch in your measurement units. Uh, for example, the difference between liters and gallons is uh, something that occurred um, on an aircraft by Air Canada when they were switching to metric. Um, and they had a situation where, during that process, a fault management system um, had failed and uh, the pilot was asked to enter the data by hand. And in that context, there was a mismatched assumption as to what the unit was supposed to be used. Another example in that context is when you implement things in software and make choices about the size of your variables. So for example, if you choose a 16-bit variable, you limit the number of values you can represent. And in the Ariane 4 or 5 case, this was the case where um, a certain um, acceleration parameter had a certain range of values in Ariane 4, but a larger range of values in Ariane 5 and caused a 
overflow, a wraparound, where the numbers became negative and the system wasn't able to react to it. In a similar fashion, when you have software, it then gets executed on um, one or more processors and the software runs concurrently, you have concurrent tasks and the communication um, between those tasks must be managed. And to just illustrate the point, uh, an application like iTunes, which looks like a relatively simple application, had problems when dual core processors came out for laptops or for, for desktops as well, that iTunes crashed randomly between the fifth and the seventh song when you were ripping a CD. The underlying reason was there were actually two tasks within iTunes, when you ran on a single processor, they were executed sequentially. Now that you move to a different hardware platform, they were executed concurrently. Updating a common data dictionary, there was no synchronization around it. In general messages, there is often uh, inherent concurrency in your system, but uh, if you don't design it right, it's not managed correctly. In a similar fashion, when you then take your application in terms of a, a communicating set of tasks, your runtime architecture, and map it to the compute platform, um, <coughs> all kinds of things can uh, c cause problems. In that process, your virtualization, you're virtualizing your hardware, that is uh, a process represents a virtual machine. Uh, you're using a partitioned architecture to provide um, safety criticality protection, and you are introducing virtual channels to uh, make your architecture more flexible. One of those scenarios actually happened with the internet when it was still the ARPANET in 1982, where all of New England was disconnected from the rest of the world for 12 hours. And what had happened was they used to have five physical trunk lines going into um, New England. Um, AT&T was then uh, starting to uh, install fiber optic cables to minimize the transfer to this um, new technology those physical trunk lines became virtual trunk lines, logical trunk lines, and they happened to be mapped all to the same physical fiber optic cable because the bandwidth was available. And as a result, you lost all of the redundancy because it now became pure logical redundancy all mapped to the same physical um, component. And somebody in New Jersey dug up that particular fiber optic cable which caused them uh, New England to be disconnected. Again, the general message is we're doing a lot of virtualization, whether it's with actual physical components, but also we are virtualizing time when you're moving software from a dedicated processor to a shared processor and into partitions, and you're sampling data at the beginning of a frame, for example. If you're now running in a partition, that partition may not get the first slot in a frame, but the third slot in a frame, so now you're sampling data at a time different than you originally expected. And this time shift may not be something that was expected by the software. And finally, you have um, not only processing of individual units, but you have end-to-end -end flows to deal with where end-to-end -end latency plays a role. And again, that brings a variety of issues to the table. One example is uh, something that happened with the F-16 in the uh, mid-'90s when they started using rate monotonic scheduling where um, once they introduced that into the system and the pilot flew the new software in the simulator, complained about blurriness of the display. And what it turned out to be the case is that the end-to-end -end latency of getting uh, information of a tracked object from the sensor to the display in a, a federated architecture took a fixed amount of time because everything was very deterministic. In the case of uh, preemptive scheduling, the end-to-end -end latency actually varied by two to three frames, which then uh, resulted in the target symbol oscillating on the screen and explained the blurriness of that situation. And in a similar situation, NASA had a, a, a scenario where they were communicating state between two subsystems about um, the um, space station, namely tracking objects around the station, handing it over, that information over to the um, command and control system. They then wanted to reduce the amount of bandwidth used on the network and only communicated ch changes to that state information, but we're doing it on a protocol that drops packets. And by just changing from state to state change information and not having guaranteed delivery of data, caused information loss in this particular situation. 
So as you can see, there's a lot of things that we do in the software, make decisions in its design, that can become now new sources of hazards to those systems. And those are often not considered when the hazard analysis is done primarily by system engineers and early in the development process. In that context, one of the key elements that play a role here is that uh, design decisions may be made at the wrong level. Reliability problems result in operational failures. Um, you have unpredictable performance, all those points that I was making earlier. And what's really going on underneath it, we don't have a good handle on what the software architecture looks like. And when I use the word software architecture, there are two pieces to the software architecture. One piece is the um, architectural design artifacts that need to be modular and so you can get modifiability in those aspects. And you have to deal with the runtime architecture of the software, namely your task and communication architecture and how it's deployed on the hardware. Uh, because those second aspects are the ones that drive all our operational quality attributes like performance, reliability, safety, and so on. When doing this, uh, obviously it will help when you do model-based type of development because now through the model you can get early insight into your systems. But even there, one has to be careful on how to approach that. Um, the aircraft industry, for example, has used a model-based development and still not quite gotten the kind of success that they originally expected. And the reason for that was that the individual analytical models were developed by separate teams. For example, the safety team was doing fault trees. Um, the um, team worrying about uh, performance of the system was doing scheduling models and timing models. All of them working off documents that were paper documents that they interpreted, created the models, and then the challenge is to also keep those models up to date. Uh, what they had then is analysis results that then had very little value by the time um, the system was being implemented and tested because there was inconsistency across the models with respect to the same system and the models were out of date. So that led to an initiative by this industry uh, called uh, System Architecture Virtual Integration, or SAVI, and you'll hear a little more about that later in, in the uh, presentation, where they said we need to have an architecture-centric approach, do virtual integration, and uh, make sure that um, the source of information for analysis is a single source, a single source of truth, so that we don't have these inconsistencies in the models that are supposed to bring the evidence, the insight into our system early in the process. Okay, so in that context, um, we have developed um, an architecture language called SAE ADL, but it only plays one piece of a puzzle to improve the quality of systems and the certification of the system. Uh, recently, we did a study for uh, the Army for the Aviation Engineering Directorate responsible for certifying a rotorcraft and in that context identified what we call four pillars for improving um, the uh, reliability or the certification and qualification of these systems. One is we need to have uh, requirements uh, in place that are well specified and are of good quality because those are the um, entities that we verify our system against and in that context we need to deal with both the mission requirements and the dependability the, uh, requirements like reliability and safety. Doing it in an architecture-centric fashion, this is where the AADL and virtual integration comes in. Using analytical techniques to provide early insight and predictive uh, uh, verification of uh, the system as we understand and catch errors that are introduced during the requirements in architectural design. Complement that with um, test results and then manage all this evidence through uh, this concept of assurance cases, um, which have uh, their roots in this notion of safety cases that got started in the UK in the, in the 1990s and was used uh, in uh, public transport systems uh, and military systems there for a while now. So given that as a basis, you then get into a software development practice, uh, which here at the SVI we call architecture-centric uh, um, practices. And it's in this context, it builds the bridge between uh, business and mission goals or stakeholder goals and quality uh, uh, requirements and the actual system implementation. Because without 
this middle layer, there is going to be a big gap in terms of the high-level requirements coming from the stakeholder and then the system implementation. And it's in this context where you then evolve the requirement, design it, uh, your architecture iterate back and forth and refine the architectures uh, and the requirements down the architecture hierarchy, as we will see in, in the rest of the presentation. And we then do the implementation of the system against the requirements uh, via testing and verification activities to make sure that the system implementation conforms to the architecture. And in that context, um, again, collect um, the evidence and have a good automated record of the evidence so we can put our assurance case together for making our case for certification. AADL itself is a architecture um, modeling language has its roots in research that was funded by DARPA in the 1990s. In particular, two languages, one called MetaH, specifically designed for met embedded systems, and ACME, which was uh, um, a language that also was intended to be an architecture interchange format. And we combined uh, elements of both of those languages into uh, AADL, and it was published as an SAE standard originally in 2004. One of its characteristics is that it focuses on not just modeling the software itself, uh, uh, but on the software side, first of all, model both the design and the runtime architecture, but also model um, your hardware platform, the mapping of the software to the hardware platform, and the physical or the mechanical system platform, and uh, the interface both in physical terms between the computer hardware and the physical platform, and in terms of logical interface between the embedded software and the physical platform. Because it is, again, in those interactions where often mis uh, assumptions are made that fall through the cracks, and uh, as a result of that, we run into problems. The standard itself is actually a suite of documents. There's the core language standard, which has been originally published in 2004 and revised uh, in 2012. Key element of uh, this architecture language is, is not is that it doesn't just have generic component and connection concepts, but has introduced a set of specific uh, concepts that have to do with modeling uh, the software and uh, hardware architectures, the runtime architectures of those. It has an interchange format that's standardized as well that allows us to pursue a open strategy for integrating a, a tool chain that uh, includes analysis and generation. And then uh, as a notation, we have a variety of annexes. We made the language extensible so you can then bring in additional concepts to support, for example, fault modeling. Uh, and you will see the error model annex um, in action um, dealing with particular styles of architectures like ERIC 653 uh, for modeling some of the interaction behavior in a, in a formalized way so we can perform model checking type of activities on it mapping data models into the um, into an architecture model, dealing with requirements definition and, and assurance type of activities as well. So there's a variety of uh, annexes that go along with the core standard, and you will see uh, some of them in action in, in this presentation. Let's first focus on uh, requirements themselves. When you look at requirements, there was a recent study for the FAA uh, that was done by Rockwell Collins, uh, team at Rockwell Collins, where one of the activities was to do an industry study about the use of requirements capture that was compliant to DO 178B. And what they found is, as you see on the left-hand side, uh, that notationally English language and shell statements and table-driven representations still dominate the process. Um, there is slowly catching on the idea that we use executable models so we can do early validation of the process. In a similar sense, when you look at tooling, word processors and uh, spreadsheets are very popular. And then for traceability, you have tools like doors that um, help you um, manage the traceability of requirements. The challenge of requirements, though, is that one of the things we have is a gap between system and software requirements. And Barry Beam has a paper and presentation of 2006 that talks about that. One of the issues that we have is that high-level requirements are developed from, by system engineers. They are refined to a certain level. And then at some point, you develop a functional specification for software that is relatively low level and then showing you a sample from uh, an actual software requirement specification. And as you see, it reads almost like pseudocode. 
So verifying your implementation against this kind of software requirement specification is a, is a small step, but ensuring that this requirement specification meets a uh, system level requirement specification can be quite some challenge if your requirement is to, for example, meet certain safety requirements. One of the things that I mentioned is traceability is obviously an important element of that process because that then makes sure that you don't have requirements for which there are no stakeholders and so on. And those are things that are supported by tools like DOORS. But the point is that there is more to requirements than traceability. There is actually a IEEE standard for um, recommended practice for software requirement specification that um, defines the concept of requirement quality that goes beyond traceability, namely, for example, dealing with uh, ambiguity, uh, uh, consistency, and completeness. And then the little table on the left, it shows from, again, um, some studies that out of those 70% uh, of requirements errors that I mentioned earlier, that 20% uh, or 21% are basically incomplete requirements. Almost 33% are simply uh, missing or omitted requirements, and um, 24, approximately 24% are incorrect requirements. So there is some low-hanging fruit type of activity that one can do to improve the quality of requirements beyond the fact that there is traceability back to stakeholders. One of the other things that we find when we look at a requirements document that when you <coughs> read the text, it actually in many cases may not just talk about the requirement of the system that they are intended for, but in some cases reach down two or three levels within a system, two particular subsystems, to already put a constraint on uh, or expectations on an architectural design of that system. In that context, what we also have to deal with is when we talk about requirements, there are the requirements on the system itself, and then there are requirements that have to do with the operational environment of the system, for example, um, regulatory rules that have to be supported or adhered to and so on and so forth. And in a similar fashion, there are requirements on the development process where you have requirements on, uh, for example, the way you go about testing and so on and so forth. What I'm showing you here as a chart is uh, something that was developed by Nancy Levison, a professor at MIT, um, who has placed strong focus on um, safety engineering, and she uses that same framework to identify hazards in uh, systems whose roots may be not just in the system this itself, but in, in the context in which it's developed. And we are basically building on the idea and saying, as we are defining the requirements, we want to be clear about which requirements are requirements on the system itself, which are requirements on the development process, and which are requirements that have to do with the system living in a particular operational context. And it's uh, that way then make sure that we have the various uh, aspects covered. The second thing that comes into the picture is as we do requirements in the context of an architectural specification, we can then look at what is it that then makes an up an architecture specification or a system specification. What I'm showing you on the left, uh, this box here, actually represents a definition of what a system process is. Uh, and it, this definition comes from the French uh, System Engineering Society that says a system process is taking input and produces output through some behavior, maintaining some state, making use of resources, and be potentially under control or living under certain operational constraints and operate in a certain environment. Given that kind of a specification, we now can talk about requirements on the input, requirements on the output, uh, requirements in terms of uh, assumptions about um, resource usage, and uh, pre and post conditions on behavior and then invariance and on state. Looking at it from a requirement specification perspective, you also can leverage work that has gone into this concept of quality attributes, um, largely driven by work at DSCI in the context of architecture, and they are recognized that some of them are developmental requirements like modifiability and assurability, and others are, again, uh, requirements on the system itself, and there I group them into mission requirements, which primarily focuses on the function, behavior, and performance, and the tenability requirements. Those are the ones that focus on exceptional conditions that deal with reliability, exceptional conditions like hazards that uh, affect safety, or exceptional conditions that 
affect uh, the security of your system and the intrusion tackles things and uh, data integrity. So these things, when we do requirement specification in this kind of a context, gives us a chance to make sure that when we look at a requirements document, have we covered all the different elements of an architecture specification, and have we covered uh, not just the functional requirements, but also some of the non-functional requirements regarding the system. One of the things that has happened as a result of that study that I mentioned earlier, uh, a handbook has been developed uh, for requirements engineering management for the FAA by this group, and it lays out a development a requirements development process in the context of an architectural specification. And that process has recently been exercised in the context of using architectural uh, modeling notation, in this case particularly uh, AADL, and a requirements capture notation called ARDL using a use case notation called URN. And what, as you see, is you want to be clear about what is the system, the system boundary, what are your operational concepts, maybe your use scenarios that you want to exercise on your system, identify requirements at that level, and then refine your system architecture incrementally and push requirements down your hierarchy and provide the rationale for these. What that then leads to is a development process, which some people nowadays call this twin peaks of requirements and architecture evolution. That is, you have requirements for the top level of the architecture. In some cases, you start reaching down one or two levels, like I mentioned earlier, and you iterate back and forth, refining uh, the requirements for each level of the architecture as it gets refined, and as you make your way down to the software architecture as well. And it's in that context where we then also deal with uh, safety aspects and, uh, of the system as well, deal with safety hazards, and then come up with uh, uh, derived requirements, as we will see in a moment. So it's in that context where we have gone now and said, can we, through a model-based approach of requirements, which kind of got started with doors where they structure the content of a requirement document in a hierarchy of objects so they can do traceability. This is now getting extended in a way that the requirements are more formalized, are directly associated with an architecture model, and the formalized specification allows us to now first of all, uh, validate whether the requirement specification is consistent and complete and becomes the basis for verification of uh, architectural refinement. As we get into the safety aspect of these systems, there are well-established safety practices uh, like DO-178 and uh, various uh, uh, other practices from uh, um, SAE, um, they have ARP, um, 47, 61, and 54, which outline activities that you do like functional hazard assessment and uh, preliminary system safety uh, assessment, common cause analysis, fault tree analysis as you're refining your architecture. And again, I'm showing at the bottom right the picture you've seen before. In that context, then uh, Professor Levison brings to the picture this notion that you need to look at safety beyond just malfunction of components take into account the fact that um, unsafe conditions may be due to interaction of system parts or the system and the environment with none of them malfunctioning, which then leads you to new safety requirements. And in that context, realize that it is often not a single element that's the cause of uh, uh, an accidental behavior, but it may be multiple hazardous contributors that together when they occur may cause a um, catastrophic event. And so it's in that context where, again, um, in the context of the ADL standard suite, there is an extension to the core language that lets you do fault modeling. We call this extension the error model annex. It itself was designed in a way that it can be actually used with architecture modeling notations other than AADL itself. Uh, the um, implementation of it obviously was done in the context of AADL since we wanted to demonstrate the ability to do such safety analysis, not just at the system engineering level, but also for the software system itself. The objective of this annex was to be able to deal with different uh, safety analysis related activities ranging from hazard analysis to uh, failure mode and effect analysis to Markov type of analysis for reliability in order to get our hands around um, 
these models being consistent with each other. And that whole process was exercised uh, recently on a example system that is part of this ARP 4761, namely a real braking system, to show that we can support this kind of process and automate this process throughout um, uh, the architectural development of such a system. The idea behind this annex is that you can specify fault behavior at several levels of abstraction. The first is a very high level. In this case, we focus on the fault interaction between component or the exceptional condition interaction. Effectively, the kind of analysis you do early in the process, like an SMEA type of work. And there's some work from York University they refer to as fault propagation and transformation calculus that basically captures the essence of what we do at this level of abstraction. The second level is the focusing on individual components, look at failures that can occur within the component and what the resulting failure mode is, how that is propagated out, and also how that component reacts to failures of other components it interacts with. The third layer then fo focuses on, given a system consists of parts, how can we abstractly represent the fault behavior of a subsystem in terms of failures of its parts, such that we can then, in a scalable fashion, deal with large-scale systems and, and manage uh, its, its faults. And then the final element of this work has been to add um, a fault ontology that helps you to go more systematically about identifying faults. And there's a predefined set of faults that basically deal with, as we are dealing with the system, no matter how it fails internally, the, the way these failures manifest themselves as an effect on other systems is that a subsystem or component may either not provide a service when it's supposed to, maybe service omission, provide service when it's not supposed to, commission, and then otherwise timing-related errors, value-related errors, given that we have sequences of uh, uh, activities, maybe uh, signal streams from sensors, for example, rate-related errors, um, we also have replication-related errors when you have replicated systems for redundancy sake and so on. And so given this ontology allows us to, again, be very systematic about finding problems. And I'm illustrating this now in this slide here. It is from an actual aircraft system where they did uh, uh, 20 years ago a PSSA flight management system, and they focused on can the flight management system continue to function if the EGI, which provides airspeed data, happens to fail. And they went through and illustrated or demonstrated that, yes, we can do that. In worst case, we will then inform the pilot and say we cannot provide the full service, but we will not cause the system to go into an uh, unsafe state, for example, into a stall state. Well, it turned out to be the case that after 15 years of flying, they had a situation where the EGI had some boards that were slightly out of spec, and then at a certain uh, level of the um, rotation, there was vibration going on causing those boards to touch, corrupting the memory, and then uh, as a result, corrupted speed, airspeed data was sent to the flight management system and it wasn't caught. So the flight management system reacted to uh, air speeds of 800 knots, which obviously are way out of range for what the aircraft actually can handle and can actually fly. And it wasn't until that occurrence happened in real flight that they then finally went and revisited their safety analysis. The fact that this could occur was actually not well known before. If we have a virtual integration approach where things are represented in models, um, the supplier of this particular subsystem could have updated their fault model that goes along with the architectural specification, delivered that on a regular basis to the system integrator, and through virtual integration, we could have found that there was a new unhandled uh, fault that uh, was not expected by the flight management system, and we could have dealt with it earlier in the process. And this is then what, what we do is, as we have the requirements specified, we then fold in the hazards that were identified into the requirement specification into, uh, in the context of an architecture model. And from those identified hazards, we then derive safety requirements that then deal with it. For example, in this particular case, the safety requirement would be for the flight management system to validate the a range of incoming data values in order to address potential data corruption type of thing. One of the things that we did in this context, once we had AADL and this era model annex in place to look at the automation of these ana analytical models like uh, um, the kind of spreadsheets that are reports from an FHA or uh, the results of an FMEA reported in um, 
in some uh, reports that are spreadsheet oriented. We also did uh, the same kind of work in automatically generating fault trees that then can be fed into fault tree analysis tools and in a similar fashion uh, generate Markov representations or uh, uh, reliability block diagrams that then also let us do stochastic analysis. By automating this process, again, since the information comes from the same architecture model, it establishes a certain level of consistency across these architectures. And what that leads to then is, as you use that in your practice, and this is now a slide from Myron Hecht at Aerospace Corporation, who has now used this automated process uh, when uh, doing safety analysis for satellite systems. And as a result of this, he has been able to do uh, this process repeatedly because it was automated, has been able to do architectural trade-off studies which they were not able to do before, and deal with scales of uh, dealing with 26,000 failure modes, and doing effect analysis of 25 levels deep, and then continue to do that and keep those models alive. Okay, so uh, given all of this on the front end, as you move through a development process, as I showed you before on the safety analysis, we support the same kind of analysis along all the different quality dimensions, whether that's security, resource, uh, re uh, timing issues on the uh, real-time performance, or data quality. As you do that, what you then have is if you're making a change to the system architecture, for example, you're changing from 128-bit uh, encryption to 256-bit encryption, it has an impact on resource consumption, which affects the end-to-end -end latency since we do more processing, which then affects the data quality and as a result can introduce um, potential new hazards that need to be addressed. So illustrating con concrete terms, what some of that means is, for example, in terms of end-to-end -end latency, you often find in your design databases and in your company a specification of end-to-end -end latency by system engineers. And the way they think about it is you have processing latency, you have sampling latency, and you have physical signal latency. And one of the things that they then encounter once they start running the system in software, the numbers never meet, match up with the numbers that they get off of the system, um, the embedded software system. And one reason is illustrated by the bottom right here. There was a study in 2006 where um, at a Swedish university they looked at the impact of the scheduling protocol that you choose on the stability of the control behavior of, of a control system. Basically what it says is as you are doing scheduling of your tasks and you have a jitter in the execution, because it's time sensitive information, it actually can affect the stability of your controller. And looking more closely, what you find is as you're making decisions in your software architecture, there's a number of latency contributors, both latency as well as latency jitter, that need to be taken into account. And doing that analytically will obviously make this whole job better than if, if you as a reviewer have to look at uh, a design document and try to figure out whether they got the numbers right. And on the right, I'm showing you an example of the kind of systems for which we need to predict the end-to-end -end latency early in the process in order to see whether architectural decisions already at that point affect uh, whether we can meet the end-to-end -end latency requirements. And as you see, there's a variety of rates that are involved in that process. As we do this virtual integration idea, this is now a slide from uh, some work that was done in the SAVI initiative that I mentioned. It's an init international initiative where Boeing, Airbus, Embraer suppliers like Honeywell, uh, Rockwell Collins, BAE, and also agencies like NASA and the FAA certification agencies are participating to work together to move to a new practice that is centered around using models for analysis but doing it architecture-centric so we have to address the single um, truth problem. There was a proof of concept done a couple of years ago, and they are now moving forward with uh, uh, this whole process and uh, maturing the technologies, getting buy-in from tool vendors, and moving it into practice. In this particular proof of concept, what we illustrated is how we can go multiple layers of architecture, initially focusing on system architecture, dealing with uh, weight, electrical, and fuel, and so on. As we then refine down into the uh, software system, we have the hardware platform. At that point, now start doing a first cut at uh, resource budgets that come from computer resources like uh, MIPS and so on. Still revisit power consumption that we had earlier. 
But at this point, I already do a first cut at an end-to-end -end, uh, flow latency analysis, given whatever much of the architecture specification we have in place. And at that point, take into account that major subsystems delivered by different contractors would live in different partition, and as a result, we can already take into account end-to-end -end latency by partitions. And if that already gets close to the required end-to-end -end latency, we may already, at this point, have a problem in the architecture. As part of this proof of concept idea, it was shown how one can use this approach for doing RFP type of things and subcontracts and negotiation, do that in a model-based fashion. So when then the proposals come back, the system integrator can establish consistency across proposals coming from different um, suppliers uh, and then ensure that there's, for example, consistency in the use of protocols, consistency in uh, the information being interchanged. Individual subcontractors, it was then shown how they can carry forward evolving their subsystem all the way down to task architecture and uh, software implementation, and on a regular basis bring these models back. Revisit uh, the earlier analyses so you continually are refining the architecture and getting higher fidelity results to ensure that everything works together. In a later stage of, of, of this initiative, we then demonstrated the interaction of system engineering and software engineering because there are obviously the physical system elements that need to be verified as well. So on the mechatronic side, they did an actuator and wing type of analysis, and the first cut is safety analysis and reliability analysis. And more recently, they have been doing a real braking system and uh, other aspects of, of an aircraft as well, and slowly are working their way to doing pilot projects within their companies to get that uh, to, towards their production groups. One of the points I wanted to get across is that when we do architectural modeling, AADL is just one notation. There are other notations out there as well, like SysML, for example, or specific even you model the hard computer architecture, there are notations like VHDL out there. You're not saying that AADL tries to overtake the whole world, but you want to understand which part of the system is useful to use certain notations. SysML can be used for system engineering type of activities. However, as you get more into the software architecture, behind AADL, we have well-defined semantics that let you then drive things like scheduling analysis that is quite precise, where SysML would not give you such semantic. On the other hand, you want to think about this as a model repository where the architectural information is stored in the repository. We may have four certain layers, even multiple notations that may express the same architecture, but in the repository, you want to minimize the amount of redundant information, information that's stored more than once, because that's then what introduces inconsistency and requires additional activity to make sure that there is intermodal consistency. And again, this uh, initiative has is currently developing a, a set of requirements on this model repository regarding this consistency. So coming towards a closure type of thing, I want to illustrate the use of some of that architecture fault analysis to help you on see how you can verify some things, diagnose some systems, verify early in the process whether a proposed solution addresses this problem and then connect it to assurance cases. This is now, uh, again, some work that is based on the fact that we have an architecture model, are able to attach fault analysis to then deal with discovering unhandled faults, discovering testable faults, but discovering them early in the process and discover faults that are hard to test for, but do it uh, through analysis. The way it would work is if you look at the particular system, you initially identify some behavior in a system where, uh, for example, you have data loss in a system because of uh, children your execution time due to preemption. Then you want to understand what is the impact of that and do that analytically so we early on in the process can see whether the impact is actually unsafe behavior, maybe for example, uh, uh, locking up of a certain protocol or um, causing an engine to shut down because it uh, has the impression that uh, bad sensor data is coming in. At the same time, you actually want to understand the root cause of this data loss because without that, uh, any kind of fixes may just be band-aids that uh, cover up the symptom rather than the root cause. And the root cause analysis would then lead you to the fact that it may have been actually a change in the scheduling protocol from a cyclic executive to a preemptive scheduling scheme that introduced non-deterministic behavior in, in your software. 
To illustrate it on a concrete example, we have recently worked with a customer that had an engine control system where they're using a stepper motor to control the fuel valve. They even were using skate to have a behavior uh, specification of the system and did some skate verification, but it still ended up losing track of where the motor position was in terms of uh, positioning the valve, and it was caused by timing behavior of the software itself. Uh, the customer had proposed a fix to the problem, but uh, it wasn't clear whether that fix will solve the problem. We then used our approach to systematically identify all potential contributors to this loss of uh, um, this step. Actually, we were able to identify two sources of problem. One of them is one that they were originally addressing, and in that context, we're also able to identify a, a potential way of dealing with data corruption that could happen if you choose a different data representation for some of the sensor information. As we were doing that, we also developed a um, assurance case confidence map in the process to show in the original architecture where the various hazards were and how one would need to address them, and in the refined architecture how um, one can have actually a much uh, simpler architectural structure that requires less verification activity uh, in the process. And as we were doing that work, we then also showed, given we have all of this uh, um, stuff model-driven, that on one hand we can auto-generate these confidence map or assurance cases, and we can use that representation as a basis for keeping track automatically about the status of the verification process, namely what kind of requirement uh, coverage analysis have we done, which kind of evidence have we brought to the table by doing model-based analysis, and what kind of evidence have we brought to the table by running test harnesses. So it becomes an underlying framework that ties together um, verification collection of evidence throughout the whole development process as illustrated in this last slide. The idea behind the whole process is that as we do the development, which is normally seen as a traditional V type of process, not necessarily in sequence, we in parallel do a second V, then we build the assurance case or build the evidence throughout the whole development process and do that by making use of analytical techniques as early as possible so we can catch problems as they are introduced, hopefully in phase, and as a result of that, reduce our um, rework cost and improve our confidence in the system, and in particular, our confidence that we will pass these um, flight tests that are done late in the process rather than those tests finally discovering problems that we introduced much earlier in the development process. And as a result of that, have cost reduction, and as a result of that, have a basis for starting to tackle this process of uh, recertification that is then in proportion to the size of change. Because now, since we are in the model environment, we can understand what verification activities would have to be repeated if we make a change to a requirement or make a change to an architecture. Um, subsystem, uh, for example, we place a, a piece of hardware and so on. And with that, I'm open to questions. Yeah. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, this is really, really quite excellent and very interesting. A um, lot of detail. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, we do have a few questions, but before that, you know, we before people go away, we uh, do wanted to pull the. Uh, all of you, uh, let's get some feedback on today's webinar. And um, so John has posted our uh, polling questions. So if you could, I'll take a moment to answer, uh, respond to these questions. I'd appreciate it. Uh, while that's going on, let me ask, uh, we, have, we do have a few questions, like I said, uh, Peter. Uh, some of them are pretty detailed, so let, but let me go through these. Um, the first one is that, uh, says that this decomposition of the architecture requires a safety critical system which has spent the money to define the architecture in enough detail to find potential failure points. However, in the case of Dota app 2.0, a fit for purpose architecture model, they are not as robustly defined as a safety critical or aircraft architecture. Have you thought of how you can take the lessons learned here to an incomplete architecture such as SV6 resource flow matrix? Yeah, what you have is, um, if you have, um, again, it becomes a question of 
the system that you're evolving, in what way do you consider it safety critical versus mission critical? Uh, even for mission critical, there are similar kind of issues. With DODAF, there, the initial focus is early in the process, and there we are trying to get our hands around uh, what are the stakeholder requirements and capturing those. And the tricky part is how to evolve that set of requirements into a set of requirements for uh, the system architecture that's going to meet that. And we need to have this interaction process, and that's where it gets into evolving from the original specification in Dota and start bringing into the picture um, an architectural specification that represents either both the physical system as well as the software system. Okay, very good. Um, the next question is, um, I understood that AADL focuses on identifying errors early to minimize the impact of a change late in the process. Systems change for a variety of other reasons, changing needs of technology and infrastructure. How does AADL facilitate evolving a system? If you want to have a system that's evolving, one of the things you would like to do is, as part of the process, both on the requirement side and when you're making architectural design, identify what I call variability points. That's kind of product line type of thinking, but you don't necessarily mm -hmm. want to approach it immediately as a product line. But basically say, are there certain things uh, and elements in your operational environment that will change? And therefore, you will constantly have to live with that aspect of your system changing. And as a result, instead of having a requirement for a particular function, to have the requirement that a certain functionality will continually change and have the ability to quickly introduce um, this new functionality. Mm -hmm. okay. The ADL supports some of that because as a language it has this ability to start specifying a partial architecture and then through a refinement concept to refine elements of that and then in that context uh, basically clearly identify variability points and then say, okay, this is a piece of the software that I um, intend to replace, and from that aspect, we can then uh, analyze what kind of impact those kinds of changes have, and at the same time, help you early on already design your architecture in a way that certain kinds of variability or evolutions that you expect are part of early in the process because those are then architectural changes that are much harder to introduce later in the process. I see. Okay. Um, is there any data on the impact to budget or schedule that must be taken into account when allocating resources initially for the program using this approach? Yes. You obviously have more, uh, some additional effort for doing some of this architecture modeling. Right. Requirement capture. Um, but the payoff comes relatively quickly um, because, for example, as you, uh, in a DOD concept, what, uh, you have a phase where that we call preliminary design review. And in, the, in that context, uh, if you are for, following some of this process uh, using more of this body-based technique, you will be able to identify technical risks at that time already, and those normally are caught much later in the process. We have done some pilot work on some projects where we were called in right after a PDR and then raised a number of questions that uh, ended up causing them to delay their CDR because the uh, contractor was not able to provide good answers on certain aspects that they simply hadn't thought about at that point in time. Okay, very good. Uh, I think I have time for one more question. Um, to what extent can the AADL approach be applied to security analysis and verification? Yeah, very very nice question. And actually, the SCI obviously does a lot of work in security as well. When you look at um, the way we approach doing this hazard analysis, um, from a safety perspective, what you're dealing with is that there are mismatch assumptions or malfunctions within um, the system where the effect is that it may cause damage to the outside world, like a person gets run over and that kind of thing. From a security perspective, the picture is slightly different. There's somebody outside the system who is trying to get in but take advantage of the same holes in our system, namely uh, mismatch assumptions, exceptional situations that aren't handled very well, and that's what they take advantage of. So there is 
and, and in that context, the security people are also saying that in many cases it's not just a single element that causes people to be able to break into your system. It's a combination of things, and that's the same kind of message that Professor Levison has about safety, where they are saying it is a combination of these minor defects or hazards or uh, uh, safety conditions that as the combination of those occur, that's what results in a major uh, accident. Uh, from the security side, it may be, again, a combination of those things that then allows people to carry out these intrusions. Okay, so very good. The underlying analysis mechanism that it comes with this uh, fault modeling concept that is associated with AADL allows you to tackle the um, safety of the security analysis as well. One of the pilots we have done in that context from a data integrity perspective, we have um, done a mapping of the Lapadula type of analysis where you classify documents in different categories and then, again, use an underlying architecture model to ensure that there is no um, confidentiality data com information confidentiality violation going on in, in your information system. I see. So in that sense, it's actually a nice example to show that some of the capabilities we have in AADL aren't exclusively targeted to safety critical systems, but can be used in mission critical systems as well. It's just the audience that had the pain first. Right. The industry and the aerospace industry were the ones that had the need for this capability first and came to us first. and those were the ones we targeted first. Oh, I see. Okay, very excellent. Um, before I let you go, I, I um, a couple of people I, I was trying to track as you were presenting. Are all your references within your slides? Uh, people are looking for a list of related publications. Some people are. Um, and do or, that. I can add a slide that has a, a set of uh, related references in there. Okay, if you could do that, and before I send them out, have that uh, page that you then can post together with the slides. That would be great. That would be great. Now there were a couple other questions. Um, it, what I will do is I will email those to you, uh, Peter, and if you can answer them, I will distribute your answers to to the attendees. And um, um, and I think I think that's it. So uh, once again, Peter, this has really been excellent. Uh, I appreciate all of your effort in, in putting this together. Um, and I thank all of you that uh, for attending today's presentation. Um, hopefully we'll have another webinar very shortly within the next month. So um, thanks again, Peter. Sure. You're welcome. Okay.